Several weeks ago, we began a series of messages on prayer. And we started this series of messages on prayer by examining the Lord's Prayer, or some call it the Our Father. We then moved on to an examination of some of the prayers made by several of the great men in Scripture. We began by examining a prayer made by Abraham when he pleaded with God <clears throat> to spare the righteous men and women in Sodom and Gomorrah. We then examined a prayer made by Moses when, he, when God threatened to destroy the nation of Israel. A prayer we called Moses' finest hour because in this prayer Moses offered himself up as a sacrifice on the nation's sinful worship of the golden calf. This morning we're going to examine a prayer excuse me, made by another great saint. We're going to examine a prayer in which King David made a request that God did not grant. A request that God denied. Now some of you are probably saying to yourselves, I would just as soon pass on this one. Thank you, Pastor. I get all of the dials I can handle. <laughs> I already know what it's like to have God say no to my prayer request. So I don't need to study a prayer request that was denied to learn more about God saying no. We all know about God saying no. Now, I understand what you mean, dear friend. I understand. But you might be surprised to learn how beneficial it is to learn about some of the reasons why God says no to our requests. And this is important because not knowing about why God says no affects our prayer lives. Sometimes we get discouraged when God gives us too many no's. There are, I believe, two major reasons for Christians failing to develop disciplined prayer lives. The first reason is this. Prayer, to a large extent seems to be a one-way conversation. Now, we all know that, but we don't like to talk about it. But that is, I think, one of the reasons why it's difficult to develop a disciplined prayer life. We speak to God in words that can be heard and understood. But God does not answer us in words that can be heard and understood. Now, I'm not suggesting that God's answers to us are non-existent. I'm not suggesting that God does not speak to us. I'm not suggesting that God is silent when we pray. God does speak to us through His Word, the Bible. He speaks to us through thoughts and desires and circumstances, but often those thoughts and desires and circumstances are understood subjectively. Often, we're not quite certain of what it is that God is saying to us. We're not quite certain of how he's answering our prayers. Now, personally, I long for the day when I will see my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with my own eyes and hear him with my own ears. And I think most of you probably feel that way as well. I long for the day when I will no longer have to depend upon the eyes and ears of the prophets who wrote the scriptures. I long for the day when I will no longer have to depend upon thoughts and desires and circumstances that are understood subjectively. I long for the day when I will see my Savior face to face and know exactly what He wants me to do in every situation. I'm not the only one who feels this way. As pointed out a moment ago, I suspect that most of you feel this way also. Now, I'm not the only one, as pointed out, who feels this way. We would all love to hear our Lord's with our own ears, see Him with our own eyes, know exactly what He wants from us. R.C. Sproul certainly felt that way. Sproul wrote, I rejoice in God's wisdom and His everlasting power. It is His persistent invisibility that saddens me. I amen that. It is difficult, he continues, 
for some for sensuous creatures to enjoy fellowship with one who cannot be seen, heard, tasted, touched, or smelled. God remains beyond my senses. How then can I relate to him with intimacy? My heart longs for fellowship with him. I long to hear his voice as the sound of many waters and to catch one glimpse of his refulgent glory. I, he continues, would crawl over glass to hear audible words from heaven saying to me, R.C., you're my own. I would crawl over glass to hear a voice of heaven saying, David, you're my own. Now, I know I'm his, but to hear his voice, what a great joy, what a great thrill that would be. There are a lot of things I'm looking forward to in eternity future, but to hear the voice of my Savior, that's at the top of the list. Now, one of the reasons why Christians fail to develop disciplined prayer lives is because prayer <clears throat> so often seems to be a one-way conversation. God dwells beyond our senses, <clears throat> excuse me, and this makes prayer difficult for us. Another reason for Christians failing to develop disciplined prayer lives is because a lot of our requests are denied. A lot of our requests are denied. And to make matters worse, when God denies our requests, we call these denials unanswered prayer. An expression that sort of suggests that God has ignored our prayers. It's kind of like making a phone call to a friend who's not at home and leaving a message on his voicemail asking him to return our call, but he never does. Making our call an unanswered prayer. When we suggest that just because God denies our request that he has in fact failed to answer our prayers, we do him a great disservice. We do him a disservice because God does not operate this way. He always answers our calls. He always answers our prayers. Now, sometimes God's answer is yes, and sometimes his answer is no. But God always answers our prayers. He never blows us off. He never ignores us. Sometime again, the answer is yes, and sometimes it's no. And sometimes God delays granting our requests, but he never blows us off. He never ignores us. The best way to handle God saying no to our request is just to admit to ourselves that we made a request and God said no, at least for the time being. When we call our denials unanswered prayer, it sounds as though God has blown us off. It sounds as though God has ignored us and nothing could be further from the truth. Again, God never blows us off. He never ignores us. Keep that in mind. I have to remind myself of that frequently because in the natural scheme of things, sometimes it seems as though he is. He is not blowing us off. Now, one of the most famous denials of requests, one of the most famous no's from God was the no God gave to requests made by King David when King David asked God if he could build God's temple in Jerusalem. David wanted to build God's temple and God said no. Now, read about this in David's prayer, David's prayer when God's answer was no. And we read about this in 2 Samuel. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, we read this. After, after the king, that is David, was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a palace of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. Nathan's approval of David's plan was, however, premature. God did not want David to build his temple. We read about that in 2 Samuel 7. That night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says, you, are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? Are you the one? Now, in Hebrew, this last sentence is constructed in such a way that it demands a negative answer. So let me rephrase the answer, moving from Hebrew to English. In English, it sounds like this. You, David, are not the one to build a house for me to dwell in. 
Now, some years, Solomon made this point even clearer in 1 Kings chapter 8. Solomon said, My father David had it in his heart to build a temple for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father David, Because it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did well to have this in your heart. Nevertheless, you are not the one to build the temple, but your son, who is your own flesh and blood, he is the one who will build the temple for my name. Now, there are a number of reasons why God said no to David. And there are a number of reasons why God says no to our requests as well. And for the next few minutes, we'll look at some of those reasons. Reasons why God said no to David. Some reasons why he says no to all of us. Because we all get no's. We need to learn to deal with them. Now sometimes God says no to our prayer requests because there is sin in our lives. Now this was not the reason why God said no to King David, but it is the reason why God says no to many prayer requests. In Psalm 66 we read this. If I had cherished, oh, excuse me, If I had cherished sin in my heart, God would not have listened. In Proverbs 28, 9, we read, If anyone turns a deaf ear to God's law, even his prayers are detestable. To turn a deaf ear to God's law is to turn a deaf ear to God's standard of righteousness. If you say to God's standard of righteousness, I'm going to ignore you, God says, I find your prayers detestable. Now, the point David is making in these verses is this. Those men and women who are determined to live lives that are displeasing to God are men and women whose prayers God finds detestable. If, in in Psalm 60, says, If I cherish sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Proverbs 28, If anyone turns a deaf ear to God's law, even his prayers are detestable. Now listen to what God had to say to some Israelites who were determined to live sinful lives. When you spread your hands in prayer, when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. To stubborn and stiff-necked Israel that would not listen to God's repeated calls that they repent, God said this. In Micah chapter 3, Then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. At that time he will hide his face from them because of the evil they have done. In Zechariah 7, God says this, God said, When I called, they did not listen. So, when they called, I would not listen, says the Lord Almighty. When I called out to them to clean up their act and repent and live righteous life, they would listen. So guess what? When they call out to me, I'm not going to listen. Now, if they called out in repentance, God would. But when when they called out asking him to bless their sinful eyes, it ain't going to happen. God turns away from the prayers of those men and women who are determined to live sinful and disobedient lives. It is as if though they were praying. Let's imagine from God's perspective what people are determined to people who are determined to live sinful lives are asking for. It sounds this way. Oh, Lord, please prosper me as I continue down this path of disobedience and unrighteousness. Do you think he really wants to answer that? Oh, Lord, please give me the good health and the strength I need to continue spitting in your face. Oh, Lord, please bless me in my wicked ventures. To those men and women who are determined to live sinful lives, God says, I will not listen to your prayers. I will not listen. Now, sometimes God says no to our prayers because there is sin in our lives. And you need to examine that. Sometimes God says no to our prayer requests because our requests themselves are sinful. Most of you are familiar with James who warned us that God would often say no if our prayer requests were sinful. James wrote, When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. 
for the motive. Look for the nature of the request. Sometimes God says no to our prayer request because there is sin in our lives. Sometimes God says no to our prayer request because our requests themselves are sinful. Now, sometimes, however, God says no to godly people who are not only living righteous lives, but whose requests are themselves godly requests. Sometimes God says no. Sometimes God says no to our prayer requests, even though he approves of the prayer requests. This was certainly the case with King David's request to build a temple for God. God did not disapprove of David's desire to build a temple. He did not disapprove of it. God did not think poorly of David for wanting to build a temple. God just didn't want David to be the one to build a temple. God wanted David's son Solomon to build a temple. And the reason, as most of you know, was because David was a warrior with a lot of blood on his hands while Solomon was not. David was a man of war, and he had shed a lot of blood, and this was not the characteristic that God wanted himself and his house identified with. Now, for those of you who are familiar with God's history through the Old Testament and God's commands to David, you might find this odd. It is true that God had ordered David to go, because God is the one who had ordered David to go to war. Why is God unhappy with him? And saying, you're a man of of, uh, with a lot of blood on your hands, but if you examine closely, it was God who ordered David to go to war. It's also true that because God is a holy God, he himself often reaches out in wrath to punish those sinful men and women who corrupt and pollute his universe. But this does not mean, however, that God likes punishing sinful men and women because he does not. On the one hand, we see David Wanted to build God's temple, said, no, you're a man of blood. But then we look and say, but God, you ordered him to go and do those things. But keep this in mind. While God did order David to do those things, he took no pleasure in it. God took no pleasure in ordering the Israelites to destroy the Canaanites. God took no pleasure in ordering David to destroy the Philistines. There is something very interesting about God and his role as judge and executioner of the wicked. Now, he must be a judge and executioner of the wicked. Otherwise, his whole universe would be as corrupt as our planet. We want God to reach out and make certain that sin does not take over eternity future. His responsibility is the moral health of the universe. In order to maintain the moral health of the universe, he must reach out and destroy that which would destroy his universe. Nevertheless, there's something interesting about his role as judge and executioner, and that is this. God really doesn't like his role as judge and executioner. He doesn't really like it. All of his acts of holy judgment, even though necessary to maintain the moral health of the universe, are acts he does not enjoy. God makes this very clear in the Scriptures. In Lamentations chapter 3, for God does not willingly Bring affliction or grief to the children of men. Ezekiel 33. Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn. Turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? And to the entire world, God is saying essentially the same thing. Turn. Turn. Why die? To Isaiah, God described his judgment against sinful men as his strange work, his alien task, something he really doesn't like to do. God did not want his temple identified with war and death and punishment. God wanted his temple identified with peace because he really does not like pouring out judgment against sin. So he chose Solomon rather than David to build his house. When God said no to David, he did not say no because he disapproved of David's desire. And he did not say no because he disapproved of David. God said no because there were big, bigger issues in play. Sometimes <clears throat> God says no to our prayer request because there is sin in our lives or because our requests themselves are sinful. 
Sometimes God says no to our prayer requests, even though he approves of the prayer request. There may be bigger issues in play. And finally, sometimes God says no to our prayer request because he has something better in mind. Something better in mind. This was certainly the case with King David when King David asked God if he could build a house for him. God said no. But then God made a counteroffer. A counteroffer in which he said this to David. Rather than you building a house for me, I, God, will build a house for you. I like that counteroffer. What an amazing counteroffer. Rather than letting David build a house for God, God decided to build a house for David, and that is exactly what God has done. He has built from from King David the most glorious house in the history of the world. Not a house of wood and stone, but a ruling house, a royal house, a dynasty. God has built from King David a family of rulers that will have been the greatest family of rulers the world will have ever seen. A family of rulers unlike any other family of rulers in the history of the world. A family of rulers who will rule forever in perfect righteousness. In 2 Samuel, we read about this counteroffer that God made to David. That night the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, Now then, tell my servant David, the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you. Who will come from your own body? I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. God to David, you want to build a house for me? No, but I will build a house for you, and it will be the greatest ruling house in the history of the world. From you, David, will come the greatest ruler in the world. From you, David, will come the Messiah And he will sit not on his own throne, but he will sit on your throne, David. And he will rule for the the world forever from your throne as your son. Not a bad counteroffer. I like counteroffers like that. And I'm sure you do as well. So anytime God says no and he wants to give me a counteroffer of that, I welcome it. King David... had a dream. He had a dream. It was a glorious dream. He wanted to build a house for God, but God said no, and in saying no, God shattered David's dream. And please note that David's dream was not a minor dream of David's. It was a major dream of David's. Few men in the history of the world have loved God more than King David. We know that from his psalms. And this great lover of God wanted more than anything else in the world to do something wonderful for the God who had done so much for him. Building God's temple would have been a wonderful way to express his love and his gratitude to God. David would have seen the building of the temple as the high point in his life. He would have seen it as his greatest achievement. He would have seen it as his greatest legacy. But God said no. God's no was not punishment for some sin in David's life. God's no was not disapproval or rejection of David. God's no was simply this. Building the temple was not part of God's plan for David's life. All of us have had dreams to which God has said no. Perhaps your dream was to be a doctor or a lawyer, a writer, an actor, a businessman, a politician, or to have some other successful career. Perhaps your dream was just to have a good job and a steady income. 
but things haven't worked out. And you're not doing what you dreamed you would be doing. Perhaps your dream was to get married and have a good and godly family, but you're still single or childless. Or you are married and have children, but the marriage has become more pain than pleasure, and there's little godliness in your children. We have all dreamed dreams, and we have all seen some of those dreams that rashed, dashed and broken. If you're in the midst of coming to the painful realization that some of the dreams you have dreamed will not come true, be encouraged, dear friend, be encouraged. The good news tucked away in David's prayer is this. God's no and his often many no's to our dreams are often filled with blessings. At the very moment God said no to David's dream, he gave David his greatest blessing. What a gracious and wonderful God to have filled his no to David with this extraordinary blessing. God inspired the author of 2 Samuel to record this event because he wanted us to know that he is a God, he is not a God who delights in saying no. He is not a God who delights in saying no, but rather a God who delights in saying yes. In Psalm 147, we read this. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. God delights in all of you who fear him. He delights in you. You are a pleasure to him. He loves saying yes to you. He doesn't want to say no. He's not a sourpuss. He's not a Scrooge. The clear message of Scripture, he delights in us. Zephaniah chapter 3. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Imagine God singing over us. I can't imagine why he'd want to sing over me, but I can imagine it for you. He says he does. I believe him. Ephesians 3. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. One of my wife's favorite verses. She quotes it all the time because God blesses her frequently. And she'll say, he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And he does it to me frequently. Be sure you thank God when he does that. Sometimes I think we take his blessings to us for granted. I have to remind myself of that every so often. I keep praying for this, praying for that, and I say, wait a minute. Look at all these wonderful things he's done. Let's thank him for them. You should. God does not delight in crushing us by saying no to our desires. But rather, he delights in satisfying our desires with good things. Isaiah tells us that we are distressed God is also distressed. Imagine that. In their distress, talking about his people, he too was distressed. When the no's come your way and you're distressed, God is also distressed. He doesn't delight in saying no. He delights in saying yes. He doesn't delight in denying you. He delights in rewarding you. That's a clear message in Scripture. Never forget this, dear child of God. Your heavenly Father only wants the very best for you. And sometimes, the very best means saying no. Let's grow up and learn to live graciously with that. Father, we love you, we worship you, we thank you for being our God. What a glorious God you are. And again, in a world gone mad, it's so good to know that we call you Father that you delight in us and that you love saying yes to us and you love singing over us and you love blessing us. We thank you for that. We recognize, painfully we recognize, that we're only too deserving. Help us appreciate your great love for us and your many, many blessings to us. Give us a good week, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.